Okay, welcome everyone to our A to J Author new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank. I'm A to J Author's project manager. A couple of tips and tricks and some A to J Author updates before we get started. Um, just a notice that we will be holding an online training for new authors in both A to J Author and Hot Docs. That will be coming in the fall of 2020. The classes start in September and run through the first week of November. It's an eight week online course where we have pre recorded videos and exercises for you to do, and then a once a week class meeting where we talk about those, um, the homework assignments, and any questions that you had that came up from the week prior. It's held in conjunction with Law Help Interactive and Capstone Practice Systems. It covers a comprehensive um, a training in how to create interviews both with a, an A to J author front end and an A to J author DAT, the document assembly tool back end, and a hot docs interview front end and a hot docs template back end, or a combination of an A to J author interview front end and a hot docs template back end. So it is um, pretty extensive if you are new to authoring to get you started um, with the process. It is open for free to anyone who is from an LSC funded organization. And if you aren't from an LSC funded organization and you are interested in attending the training, reach out to the folks at Law Help Interactive, Claudia Johnson and Miranda Magelli. They can help um, get you signed up and tell you the details if you're not LSC funded. If you are interested, keep an eye out for a registration announcement from the LHI team. It should be coming out in the next couple of weeks via the listserv and um, the, sort of their publicity uh, department. If you are more interested in a self-paced learning for just A to J author, we do have training videos on our YouTube channel. That same series from the fall of 2019 related to A to J author is recorded and on a playlist um, on the YouTube channel. You can also do our sample exercises, which are available um, at the URL on the screen or under the learn tab um, on our website, atajauthor.org, which allow you to um, watch the series of four videos, do some sample exercises, and give you an in-depth knowledge of how to author in A to J Author. So that's all of the tips and tricks I have. I am very excited to um, introduce our guest speakers from Lone Star Legal Aid. We have um, four speakers, Luigi Bai, Lauren Figaro, April Williams, and Andrea Martinez. They're gonna talk to you about their project um, that they have started working on and have, have deployed. Um, the Texas Eviction Help Project, which is um, a resource related to uh, COVID evictions um, that is written in A to J author, uses an, inter an A to J author interview for a front end, uses the A to J author DAT, the document assembly tool, to create the documents that the end user would need, and is hosted on our um, hosting site, A to J.org, that Callie provides for free to anyone who's doing work for. Um, self-represented litigants for free. So I am going to turn uh, the screen and the controls over to Luigi and let him do some uh, introductions. Great, thank you, Jessica. Let me see if I can get my screen set up. And I'll keep an eye on the questions and chat as we're going along, Luigi, and I'll just um, uh, save them for the end or bump out if it's important. Great, I appreciate it. Thanks. So today we were going to talk about producing and delivering content to non-attorneys using the A to J software. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do before we got started was to give us a moment to reflect on the time that we're in. Um, right now we're all working really hard to make sure our communities aren't taken advantage of during this time. And uh, I imagine we all know friends and loved ones who are impacted by the virus. Uh, so if you're listening to this recording after the emergency passes, which I hope is soon, uh, please think back on what it was like. All right. So again, my name is Luigi Bai. I'm a project director at Lone Star Legal Aid. And I want to tell you a little bit about who we are and uh, our context. Lone Star provides pro bono services to the eastern third of the state of Texas. Uh, we're an LSC funded organization and we're one of the three major LSC funded uh, groups in Texas. There are two other large ones that uh, have non-overlapping territories with us. 
uh, we serve 72 counties in East Texas, and we happen to also serve four more counties in Arkansas. Uh, our partners across the state include Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, TRLA. They serve 68 counties in South Texas. And Legal Aid of Northwest Texas, Landwit, they serve 114 counties in North and West Texas. Uh, so together we cover the whole state. Uh, LSC, by the way, stands for Legal Services Corporation. It's a federally funded um, organization that supports legal aid uh, all across the country. So in Texas, I'm sure you know that we've seen our share of disasters, including hurricanes and tornadoes, flooding and wildfires. So it shouldn't really be surprising that almost two years ago, the federal government gave us funding to work collaboratively across the state um, to develop information that's relevant to our service areas during and after a disaster. And so that's covering three fairly well-recognized periods, the time immediately during a disaster, about six weeks to six months after a disaster, and then six months uh, to years after a disaster. And the types of legal problems that you see differ depending on how far you are out from a disaster. Um, so we're not only building out content, we're also developing a technology component to help our visitors better find the information that we're developing. Um, I direct the collaborative project, and last year the Texas Access to Justice Fund also gave us additional resources to develop more disaster-related information. These materials are designed to provide accurate and relevant legal information in as plain English or in the native language as possible. And I want to point out that we're also translating our materials into Spanish and Vietnamese because those are the second and third most prevalent languages in our service area. Um, oops, sorry. So these materials are primarily focused on people who don't have an attorney to help them with their legal problem. Right, you'll see in your handouts uh, on the on your uh, go to webinar panel there uh, a presentation from the April Cali uh, A to J webinar that talks about helping self-representing persons during the pandemic. And you're probably also aware already of the access to justice gap that's all around our country. People who need our services and who qualify, uh, but we don't have the resources to be able to serve directly as our clients. Here in the, uh, the state of Texas, the state bar estimates that our legal aid organizations all across the state can help about 10% of the people who need us. So, you know, that leaves the question, what happens to the other 90%, right? So at the time that we got our funding, our state really did have disaster-related and other legal content and forms available to self-represented people. Um, but those were available in websites that people could search for and find on their own. Now, people who are not attorneys don't necessarily know how to diagnose their legal issue or issues, and they'll often have trouble picking through the materials that they do find, right, to figure out what they need to do. As a community, and as, you know, we've been to the various uh, conferences and gatherings, we know that we've been developing navigator and triage systems to guide people to information and forms that they need. That's a little bit of what our project is doing, uh, at least the first one. We're using interview technology either to provide relevant information to people and or encourage them to apply for legal assistance if the problem is really complicated. Um, we continue to do that. We don't want to give, the pe give some information and somebody the impression that it would be easy to move forward without an attorney if we really don't think that's the case. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about why we're using A to J Author to do this. Um, but in addition to that, I thought we would give you an overview of our content development process. For us, it's not enough to develop an interview or a navigation based on current conditions and then publish it and move on to something new. We've developed a process that's deliberate in engaging subject matter experts right at the beginning from our organization and across the state in our partner organizations. Uh, we produce documentation and artifacts all along the way to facilitate programming and review. And then we review the content periodically with subject matter experts to make sure it's relevant in a changing environment. 
uh, and we continue to, to learn and to teach ourselves how to make this legal information comprehensible by non-attorneys. So we've adopted the plain English writing process. Uh, we try to track what statutory, regulatory, and administrative authority informs each part of our content so we can quickly find and update content as conditions change. And that has been uh, particularly interesting uh, during this pandemic as we not only see statutory changes, right, amendments to the FFCRA and the CARES Act, et cetera, we also see new guidance come out uh, from agencies and other voluntary um, things like forbearance and uh, eviction protections from individual agencies as well. So we, we know we have to keep this up to date over time. Um, we may, and while we're doing all that, we're maintaining development on multiple versions of the interview so that we can make rapid fixes to the one that's already out in deployment while we're still continuing to make uh, the changes necessary to come out with the next version. Uh, sometimes that's a challenge. So uh, today we've got Lauren Figaro, who's going to be up after me, talking about our content development process. Uh, following Lauren will be April Williams, talking about the current topics that we're um, currently covering and developing. And then after that, we have Andrea Martinez, who's our A to J programmer, talking about her experience learning A to J and using it. So. Uh, why are we using the A to J author software itself and the document assembly tool in particular? Well, we haven't yet tested this ourselves with users, but it's our impression that the visitor experience seems to re be really robust. I mean, it's evolved over 20 years. Uh, we can explain terms and larger concepts with pop-ups and the learn more feature. And if you're familiar with A to J, you know how those work. And if not, uh, you'll get to see a little bit about how we exercise those. Conditional logic within the interview allows us to do sophisticated routing inside the interview. Um, so especially we can tell if things have been asked and answered already and we don't have to ask them twice. Uh, or we know based on previous answers whether we need to branch somewhere new uh, given a, the answer to the current question. And we can create complex documents with really targeted information, really targeted instructions, and filled in court documents. So as part of our eviction interview, um, you can walk away with an answer that you can file in court and based on the questions that you've answered in the interview, we can provide verbiage in there helping you, you know, make your allegations about how the, the notice to vacate was deficient or the petition, et cetera. And then as uh, we discussed later with Andrea, the programming environment's easy to come up to speed in with good visual support for development, and as, uh, as Jessica pointed out, pretty extensive training materials on the A to J website in, in text format and videos up on YouTube. And we found it easy to deploy it on a to j.org. We didn't have to stand up our own server to be able to run the interviews or run the DAT, so that was great for us as well. I mean, it's, it, it was very easy to get started and get deployed. All right, so I hope you find the process interesting. And because we're learning new ways to do this as we go, uh, I know we'd appreciate your suggestions and feedback. So now I'm gonna turn this over to my team to explain how we developed the content and all the rest. Um, my name is Luigi Bai. My email address is up on the screen and uh, I welcome your, your feedback and emails. I'd like to turn this over to Lauren. Thank you, Luigi. Um, my name is Lauren Figaro. I am a content uh, attorney and content developer of with Lone Star Legal Aid. I work with Luigi to um, to create the content that goes into the A to J. Uh, me and April both do that. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about that process. Uh, so the first thing to remember is that this process is a collaborative one between attorneys who specialize in the area of law we're working in. We call these our subject matter experts and uh, the attorneys who specialize in breaking down that law to a level that is usable by non-attorneys. And those are the content developers, including me. Um, and this is, I want to emphasize that this is a collaborative process because um, there's a bit of a push and pull here. We want to give people the information. We want to give people information that is legally accurate 
and addresses all the important issues, but we need to tailor it to the needs of non-attorneys. Uh, non-attorneys need simple information. Um, as attorneys, we tend to favor a just a faithful, exact representation of nuanced legal concepts over simplicity and understandability uh, because we're used to conveying this information to a sophisticated audience. But for this process, it's important to understand that the people we are conveying the information to will not will not need or understand this nuance, um, and we want to avoid conveying so much nuance that it makes the information unusable. So uh, well, the goal is to give the information, the users accurate information without overwhelming with them with complexity. This is the point of plain language. So um, right now we, we try to get all of our, our uh, writing down to a sixth grade level. We try to use um, bolding and breaking it up in chunks and make it readable. And we find that A to J is really helpful for this process because the format allows for uh, really good breaking down of topics into discrete parts that people can understand. Um, so to the first step in our development process is uh, research um, and initial consultation with subject, subject matter experts. Uh, the content developers, me and April, we, we initially researched the topic to figure out uh, what we think would be helpful to a, a user, an, a non-sophisticated, non-attorney user, and then we take a rough outline of this and bring it to our subject matter experts, and they tell us if they think we need to add something, if they think something is unnecessary, um, and if what we've, we've done initially is, is accurate. And based on their, that initial feedback, we go on ahead and make an outline. I'm going to share with you guys a, um, an example of the outline we make. We, we, usually, we use Google Docs for all this because it's really great for, for collaboration. Um, here is an example of the outline we make. So in a, we, we break everything down into two parts. We have the question, uh, the list of questions, and then depending on how you answer that question, we direct you to what we call an output message. For A to J, the output message can either be a learn more, uh, it can be a pop-up, or it can just be something that we completely direct you to another page. Um, for additional lengthier information. Um, because we're, we're aiming towards having people have a walkaway document, we, we attach variables to these questions, and depending on how they answer some of them, a lot of these questions have to do with allegations. Uh, this, is not, this is, for instance, for a writ of reentry that we're working on. So you'll see this violation variable here that will correlate with a variable in the walkaway document. The walkaway document includes instructions that have, um, I'm trying to find a variable for you, here you go, variable instructions. So depending on how they answer the questions, we, will, we can give them different instructions for what to do with it. Um, and also with very, and then, I'm sorry, I was scrolling. Uh, and then for the complaint, we have variable allegations in the complaint that will also correlate with the way we answer that question. So we develop this outline, and um, once we feel comfortable with where it is, and we develop the, the walkaway document, and once we feel pretty comfortable with where it is, then we enter it into a flow chart uh, that I'm going to show you uh, using Miro. Oh, sorry, wrong thing. <laughs> One second. Nope, here we go. Tab, there we go. All right, so um, we enter into this flowchart. We find that this flowchart is easier for the person who is entering the outline into A to J to work with, and we also find it easier to collaborate on this flowchart as well because you can make comments and you can really see where everything's supposed to be going. So the outline I was just showing you was the lockout outline. Um, this is the lockout outline on Miro. Um, our entire eviction project is all in one giant flowchart here, and it really helps people get the big picture. Um, so once we have it in the flowchart, then uh, we enter it into A, A to J, and at that point we take it back to our subject matter experts. 
make sure we have a we have a pretty long session with them to make sure that um, everything is accurate. They take a look at the A to J, they take a look at the outline, and we, we go over every point one by one, and we make sure we have everything accurate. And then if there's changes that need to be made, we we make them, and then we go back to them again, and it truly is an iterative process of continually going back to the subject matter experts and making sure it's accurate. And this process can be as long or as short as it needs to be um, to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the way everything is worded. Um, so once once that last subject matter, once that last subject matter collaboration is complete, uh, at that point we can publish an A to J um, and translate it. Uh, so that's the that's the the last step for that particular version of the uh, of the interview. And um, but we're if we want to make changes to the interview at that point, we're going to make a different version, um, and we'll do we'll start this whole process over again with the additional the subsequent versions of the interview. Um, and it's just I think the the important takeaway from the our content development process is the fact that it is a continuous collaboration between the content developers and the subject matter experts, and that um, it does require a significant amount of organization. But uh, if you use collaborative tools such as Miro, the flowchart, and uh, Google Docs that you can comment in, it makes the process a lot easier and it is very doable. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand over this now to. April, who is going to talk about the topics that we are working on in our current project. Okay, so I'm here. I hope you all can see my screen. Um, I'm just going, my name is April Williams. I'm with Lone Star Legal Aid. I'm an attorney and content developer, as Lauren just mentioned. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the substantive topics that we use in the A to J interview. Um, as most of you know, uh, on March 13th, the president declared a national emergency uh, in order to take active measures to combat the coronavirus. And with that, um, with those measures came a series of laws and moratoriums, um, the first of which was the foreclosure and evictions moratorium. This put an initial 60 day hold on for new foreclosures for federally backed mortgages and also put a halt to evictions for properties that were either federal that had a federally backed mortgage or um, for federally backed housing uh, for renters. And um, later came the CARES Act and the CARES Act uh, was passed a few days after the moratorium and that kind of flushed out the protections that were afforded um, for property owners and for renters uh, during the COVID emergency. We kind of put our uh, our interviews. We put our interviews into, as uh, Luigi mentioned, into sections and into versions. And in our first version, we uh, sp uh, did the evictions process and you know what protections were afforded under the CARES Act and under the moratorium. Um, during the first period, and then that first period. Uh, the moratorium basically um, prohibited landlords from filing new evictions or giving notices to vacate during the moratorium period. This was very important for a lot of people who were facing um, evictions during that time. Um, as I mentioned, um, the coronavirus definitely it has taken its toll, and uh, in this in Texas in particular, we found that over um, there have been like over 19,000 evictions filed, and in those evictions, only one percent of the people facing the eviction actually had legal representation. So we found that the in, the information that we collected during the interview process um, was very helpful to uh, tenants in them trying to defend their evictions. So during the first period, the landlord is not able, was not able to file an eviction or give a notice to vacate. And then at the end of the period, we found that uh, there was a 30 day notice that had to be given to um, tenants before an eviction proceeding could continue. Now, as we 
as time passed and more information came available, we did our second round or our second version of the um, interview. And we're still working on that version, but we found that we needed to expand the landscape of um, interview topics um, because there were a lot of areas of concern that we did not address in the first interview that we found to be very important during the um, very important to evictions that people were facing. Um, one topic that we found to be very important was, as Lauren just um, showed you all, were the illegal lockouts. Um, we found that that was an important topic because we, you know, we stay abreast on the news and in Texas in particular, they, landlords are allowed to lock tenants out, but in order for them to lock you out, there are certain um, certain rules that have to be followed. And as we were watching the news, we found that that actually did not take place or was not taking place. So with the, the information that we gathered from the interviewees, we were able to generate um, documents, um, as Lauren showed you, um, what is called a writ of reentry to enable uh, tenants who are facing lockouts to file with the court so that they are able to gain access back to their properties. Um, we found that the illegal lockouts was an important topic to address in the interview um, as we did the second round. The other area that we found important to address in the second interview was the uh, federally funded housing, which was covered by the moratorium and the CARES Act. Uh, these are properties that would be considered um, low income, such as Section 8 or public housing. And uh, we found that there were specific laws that applied to uh, federally funded housing. And in those specific law, with those specific laws, um, we knew that most, some landlords or some properties may not follow the laws because there was a, in particular, there's a um, notice to terminate that has to come before the actual eviction proceedings can be filed. So we created questions that would go through the actual, whether your assistance was terminated first before the eviction lawsuit came into play. And then, of course, every state has their own um, state mandated eviction requirements that come into play when it comes to federally housing. Uh, we found that in Texas in particular, because that's where we are in Texas in particular, not only do you have to give the notice to terminate, but you also have to give the state mandated requirements when it comes to um, filing an eviction. And the A to J interview enabled us to you know, navigate a um, a tenant through the interview to gather this information to determine if you know their landlord had violated any of these protections. The other topic that we focused on was the foreclosures. Foreclosures was another area that was um, mentioned in the moratorium in the CARES Act. And uh, we found that in America, roughly two thirds of all mortgages are covered by a federally backed mortgage, such as the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So it was important for us to figure out what information would be pertinent to a um, person who was facing a foreclosure during this time. Um, the moratorium and the CARES Act basically stated that a um, if you had a federally backed mortgage, you're not a lot, the foreclosure, the, excuse me, the loan servicer is not able to initiate any new foreclosure proceedings during the eviction period or the moratorium period. And uh, we found that many like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac offered uh, other protections for their um, homeowners to protect them during the coronavirus emergency. A part of that, um, a part of those protections included offering uh, up to 12 months of forbearance for homeowners. This was very important, of course, because so many people were losing their jobs and were unable to make their mortgage payments. Um, but what we found uh, prior to when we did our initial um, eviction interview, and we were going to focus on the foreclosure eviction interview, we found that the mortgage lenders were not giving everyone all of the uh, forbearance that they were entitled to. So what A to J allowed us to do was to develop a letter. And that letter um, basically 
we took them through the you know questions to ask them about their you know property who their homeowner um who their loan servicer was you know if they qualified if they wanted to ask for cares forbearance and the a to j enabled us to generate a letter that they were able that the homeowner then can take and send to their uh, loan servicer to request the forbearance that they were entitled to and um this was very important because uh, many like as we mentioned many as i mentioned many people were not qualifying or the loan servicer was not giving them the full amount of uh, protection that they were entitled to um, under the cares act um, the last topic that we had focused on during the corona emergency was the um, family and medical leave act and the extended sick leave um, this basically um, during this time when the CARES Act was passed, of course, many people lost their jobs, schools closed down, um, daycares closed, people were at home taking care of people who were affected by the virus, and the uh, government passed the CARES Act, and as a part of the CARES Act, they, it gave protections for people who were uh, dealing with these emergencies in their lives. Um, there was paid sick leave that was offered in some instances. Um, many jobs offer um, uh, many jobs offered people 80 hours of sick pay. Uh, unemployment benefits were extended. It basically covered uh, anything that you can think of that someone would be uh, facing during a corona emergency, so that you weren't left out without any income or any means of taking care of you and your family during this emergency. Now, many of these um, protections have expired or are set to expire. Um, and just this morning, as we were doing our morning call, uh, I pulled up information on something that just recently, a new law that recently uh, was passed or a new protection that was actually just passed um, to assist people during this time. And as we continue to develop our content, we are always looking for the new information and updating our processes as much as possible because with any time a new bill is passed, there's always a lot of uh, redrafting and reissuing and mandates that come into play. But A to J gives us the ability to quickly find what needs to be changed and address it. So that's basically the topics that we are addressing with the A to J interview. And I'm going to give this over to Andrea. Thank you. I'm going to make myself presenter again, and then um, we wanted to do um, Andrea's session sort of in a um, question and answer format. So I have um, a couple of questions to ask her. Um, if you all have questions for Andrea or the rest of the team, feel free to put those into the question box or the chat box, and we can add those at the end. The first thing is first, um, Luigi introduced Andrea. Um, as their A to J developer, but I wanted to give her a chance to tell us a little bit of how you started working on this project, sort of the path that got you into um, joining the, the Lone Star team and being part of the development process. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Martinez, and um, I am a paralegal with Lone Star Legal Aid and now a programmer. I started working with uh, Lone Star in March, and to be exact, it was March 2nd. Um, my boss, which is Luigi, he introduced me to A to J. And first he said, hey, look, uh, there's this program. Um, I think you're really going to like it. Um, he asked me to take a look at uh, some of the videos. And if it was, if it was something of interest, uh, then to continue watching the rest. So I went and go ahead and created an author account and started watching some of the videos. And then shortly after we got news about COVID, uh, you know, hitting our city, uh, we had to come up with a plan to continue our workflow while implementing ADJ as part of our project. Um, the videos were very, very helpful to me. Um, I've never been a programmer of any kind. Um, you know, they were a bit confusing to me at the beginning because of the same reason that I've never done programming before. 
Um, my background is more of interacting with individuals in person and being able to develop that relationship, you know, with our visitors, our clients face to face. Um, so I started with our employment benefits. Um, and as I'm going through the whole interview, um, figuring things out and, um, you know, it, so far it's been, I, I've enjoyed working with A to J. Um, there's some been there's been a couple of challenges that I've had to you know figure out, but you know there's there's it's not fun if you don't have any challenges, right? So um, being able to create this interview regarding the evictions, the foreclosures, and putting all of that in one whole interview, it's been really long, very challenging. But at the same time, once you look it up into A to J and you have a little avatar and you have everything, um, you know, set up right. It, it looks it looks really good. Uh, we've all, I think we've all got excited when we saw the little um, little avatars pop up on the screen. It was like, oh, this looks really good, you know? Um, I felt like it was user-friendly when I first saw the avatars. I really liked it. Thank you, that's helpful. Um... So you did the training videos. Um, did you dive right into the project then um, right away, or did you um, do? Sometimes when I when I train, I talk about doing sort of a um, a sample project or one of the sample exercises or something to sort of get your hands wet before you dive into an actual project. But you guys had mm -hmm. uh, time constraints, obviously under COVID. Yeah. So yeah, um, actually, I tried you know something small. Uh, to begin with before diving into our whole evictions or our unemployment, um, just so I could see if I could put the pieces together and figure out how to connect the pages and especially with the variables being a little bit challenging to me. Um, but I, you know, it was Luigi's advice as well. Hey, um, let's start with something very small before we can go ahead and move forward with our project. So, you know, it was, it was just, now we have this big interview going on so you know it was it was really good to start off with something small i was really impressed watching um the, lauren talking about the different tools you guys use uh to sort of get mm -hmm. you to the authoring point of it do you jump in at the very end when you have the miro um flow chart or are you working sort of through the whole process and seeing how they're drafting the question uh no i'm working through the whole process um they uh take care of the documents they do the um the whole google docs they build the skeleton and then the outline and then they um well i think all of us we're all part of uh miro um miro looks so nice and so organized because uh they put all the work in there and i go based on miro and the outline and i implement all of that into a to j Okay. Um, do you have any advice for a new author that is just getting started? Um, something that, you know, you, you wish you had known uh, back in March or something that we do or don't have that would be particularly helpful for new authors getting started? Um, I didn't get to watch all the videos. That would be my very first advice. Watch all of the videos because as I was uh, practicing on my very first interview, I had to go back and look for those videos so I can make sure that I was doing it the right way. Um, you know, and practice just building a small interview for themselves in case that they mess up, they can always go back and make the change. Um, one of the features that I found very easy to use and that I personally like were the buttons and the pop-ups. Um, the pop-ups were really cool. Like, you know, you can just, you know, add a big paragraph on there and then you just uh, click on the wording and then the whole um, the description of what you're trying to explain to them just shows up, you know. Um, you know, as far as the buttons, um, especially if you have multiple yes and no questions, um, they're very easy to use, but I was only allowed to use three buttons. So I think adding a couple of more buttons wouldn't hurt. Um, that would be, you know, my suggestion as far as adding something more to it. And my advice would just be, you know, um, continue watching all of the videos. Uh, once you catch up with all the videos, I feel like you're a lot more comfortable working alone. 
Excellent. Um, yeah. And so just as Andrea mentioned, like they would um, like to see sort of changes to the interface of A to J to allow for more buttons. That's the sort of feedback we love to hear from our authors. We're always open to feature requests like that or bug reports if something's not working the way you expect it. Um, you can always just shoot me an email and my email's on the next slide to ask for something to be added um, and it goes into our issue queue and we sort of work on it through grant funding restrictions and other deadlines but we sort of we keep a running log of things that new authors would like to see and we try and get the funding to support those so we love hearing from our authors maybe Andrea you can talk to this or anyone else from the team but this whole process what was sort of your timeline for um, getting that Google Doc started with the outline to having an actual interview ready um, for user testing or to get out to the public? How long did it take you for the whole process? For me, uh, in regards to A to J, because that's the one that's the one program that I am more involved with, um, we had, you know, like how Lauren was explaining, we had the, um, all of these, the expert matters, you know, like we've had them, um, look at our uh, our content to see if it's uh, good to be up and running. But right now, I think we have a timeline, um, which would be July 25th for all of this to be, you know, completely good to go. Um, as far as the outlines, that would be a question for the rest of the team, because I don't really, um, I'm not too involved into the skeleton outlines. I can jump in. Uh, this is Lauren. Um, so getting the outlines together, it really kind of, it depends a lot on the topic uh, and uh, the subject matter experts. Uh, so the portion of our interview that deals with straight up just eviction, I, I felt like that went rather quickly because we already had worked on some eviction topics for a different interview. Uh, and so we were more familiar with it. The questions are pretty straightforward because you basically just go down the line of the statute. Uh, so um, we, I, I think we got that outline together in about, oh, I mean, we, we had the subject matter experts and then we got the outline together in about a week. And then we spent a lot of time fine tuning it after that. I think the larger part of the process is the fine tuning process, but that got out rather quickly, um, especially because we really did want that out as soon as possible. Um, but then there are some uh, topics that we're getting into, such as um, manufactured homes and subsidized housing is taking a little bit longer because it's much more nuanced. Uh, there's not just a single statute that you can just go down the line of. You have to research a lot of different topics. But that that time differential is mostly based on the um, legal research rather than the development process. Um, the development process can go really quickly or take a while just kind of depending on the topic. I was surprised at how short it took us to get, to ev get eviction done though. Yeah, that is really impressive. The turnaround of a week um, with all of the detail that you have in your outlines. Do you see this as being a, a one-off project or something that your organization will continue sort of past COVID, God willing, we get past COVID, that, uh, that you'll continue in different areas beyond ones that are strictly related to um, helping people in during the emergency? Well, we're committing to uh, helping people with all different kinds of disaster topics. And so, yeah, we, we see this uh, continuing in, in various forms past that. We're going to move past landlord-tenant uh, to do, um, you know, we're, we're, we're producing content for um, things like unemployment benefits, uh, dealing with wage theft issues, various things that are related with FEMA, uh, family law issues that come up, et cetera. So, um, yeah, we, the, between the two different projects, the LSC and the, and the TAGIF work, we're, we're definitely seeing this long term. Excellent. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, we have one person with their hand up and one question that came in. So I'm going to read uh, the question that came in because it's related to process. Um, and so Chris is asking if it is mandatory to use Miro for flowchart information and how to get the process. Oh, sorry. Is it mandatory to use Miro for flowchart info and to get the process done well? So it's it's not mandatory to use Miro for A to J author. Um, we're releasing a, um, a new tool within our map that would allow you to sort of sketch out an interview ahead of time. 
um, before you started programming in the variables and the exact questions. So um, I've seen other tools be used besides Miro, but um, the example that Lauren showed us is one of the best I've ever seen in terms of seeing um, how one interview fits into um, not just the one interview itself, but how it fits into the larger process. So um, I really like how Miro, how you guys have, have deployed that. Do you want to talk a little bit about Miro at all, the rest of the team? Yeah, I think there are two things that Miro gets us uh, that are really, a um, couple of things that Miro gets us that are really advantageous, and this is probably true of any online system. Uh, first one is that it's a collaborative environment, and so we can all work on the same board at the same time. We can post comments and resolve comments, uh, so there's sort of a rudimentary issue tracker. Uh, it integrates with other software, such as you know if you're doing an issue tracker like Jira or, or something else, you can integrate with that. And it also integrates with Google Docs. And so one of the th when Lauren was showing that outline, she was showing that we have separate docs for to, to document the pop-ups or to document the learn mores, et cetera. Um, those drop right into Miro. And so you know, we just show those as dependent objects on a page as a learn more or as a pop-up. And so um, just being able to edit those things in place and see how they all play out has been advantageous for us. And I look forward to the to the new map in, in A to J too to play with that. But right now Miro's Miro was the best thing we could find. I like the idea of the um, collaborative environment and the ability to add comments and sort of um, mark up your work as you're going on if other, if multiple people are working on it. So that's um, sort of a neat feature that could be added. It won't be in our map in the first iteration of it, but I like that as an idea. So we can learn from other project management tools to try and make um, the process of authoring as smooth as possible. All right, does anyone else have questions for the Lone Star team or about their development process or anything they're working on? While we're waiting for any of those to come in, I just really wanna thank you all for um, explaining this. Um, I think it's really important for uh, people in the community to see how you can tackle an emergency problem that comes up and how um, online tools can be used to help when literally you can't have your open, your office open or the courts aren't open. I think this is a really great use of A to J author, which is why I wanted to show it. But I also think you guys are handling the development process in a way that can help whatever tool somebody ends up using as the ultimate output of the interview. Um, I really liked the Google Docs that you used and the Miro um, and how you are working with different subject matter experts, content developers, project management tools to make this a professional process that can be kept up um, instead of sort of a one-off. So I just really want to thank the, the Lone Star team um, for coming on today and talking to us. And someone iterated or mentioned in the comments that viewing the Google Docs was very helpful and they thank you guys for sharing that. Speaking of sharing, um, I'm, I don't know, but would, would you all be willing to share um, sort of your sample Google Docs or share your Mira uh, flowcharts or any of your interview files if other states are looking to implement something similar in their state? Sure, absolutely. I just, it would probably be the easiest if we were to schedule a, you know, like a call first to go over how, how we organize the documents and, and look at the different types because there's a lot there. Um, it's probably harder to just dump a set of documents or a link to somebody and say, play with this. But um, yeah, totally. Awesome. Thank you. So I will um, get this recording out as soon as possible. Um, and in the recording, if you don't mind, I'm going to include um, your emails so that the team or the other teams who might be interested can reach out. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions or um, hands raised. So um, just a big thank you then to the Lone Star team and our next webinar is uh, the first Thursday in August. So have a um, happy 4th of July and everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.